It's been the longest period in American history without an economic problem. So I mean, maybe we're never going to have economic problems again. The politicians in Washington say they've solved all our problems. Well, if you believe them, everything is great. I happen to have read a little bit of history, and I know that's never been the case, so I'm worried. Welcome back to Soar Financially. Thank you so much for joining us here on this channel where we discuss the macro to understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the CEO of the Soar Financial Group and the at JR Mining Guy on Twitter. And in a few short seconds, I'll be joined by Jim Rogers, legendary investor, commodities expert. I don't think he needs any further introduction. I'm really excited that he's coming back on the channel because we're going to review 2023 a little bit. I'm going to ask Jim what, what his most important events were in 2023, events that shaped the market. And of course, what is his outlook for 2024, all with the commodities in mind, because we are a commodity-focused channel here, and we're trying to understand the macro to understand the commodities, the micro, meaning the mining stocks and the mining environment a little bit better. And uh, I think Jim is the perfect guest for that. And uh, before I switch over to my guest, hit that subscribe button. It really helps us out bringing Jim, guests like Jim on the program. And now, with, without much further ado, Jim, it's great to have you back on the channel. It's good to see you again. I am delighted to be here, Kai. Well done. Thank you. No, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for making the time. I, I'm I'm not sure how busy it is out in Singapore before Christmas, but uh, I'm running from Christmas party to Christmas party. I have three kids, and every everybody's got something going on. So, well, we do have Christmas <laughs> in Singapore. The lights are up. The everything is decorations are everywhere. So we have it too. Yes, fantastic. Yeah, I'd all, all, I know, remember lots of humidity and heat, of course, in Singapore as well. So it's I'm not sure how easy it is to get into the Christmas spirit. <laughs> well, it is on the equator, so it's always hot or hot and raining. So, uh, no. and if um, it's raining, it's not going to rain long. But sure. it's always going to be hot. I like Singapore. It's one of my favorite cities in the world. I have to admit, it's, it's always exciting to be there. Um, Jim, let, let, let's dive right in. Um, let, let's discuss 2023, and uh, let's start with your main takeaways from the last 12 months here, and uh, what was something that really made you listen up? Well, I'm delighted we all survived 2023. <laughs> but, you know, historically, the year before an election in the U.S. is usually a good year in the stock market because the, everybody, all the politicians know the election's coming. They try to get everybody happy for the coming election. So it happened again. We had a good year, and now we're going to have an election. I think we're going to have an election. I hope we are. You're the second person within a week that mentions that uh, we might not have an election. What what makes you say that, Jim? Uh, I, I don't say that with any seriousness, other than the fact that human beings do strange things throughout history. Even American human beings do strange things. So, no, I fully expect to be voting next of November. Yeah. No, we had uh, Simon on uh, Simon Hunt on earlier uh, or last week, and uh, he was discussing that in a time of war, for example, that uh, elections might be held off uh, because of a crisis. But I think if we go back and look, America's always had elections, even during wartime, even during the war between the states. So, I suspect we will have. No. elections again he, he didn't say it was a forecast it was a possibility is one of many of course uh, looming out there so i was curious i had to follow up since you mentioned that uh as well so but uh, any other events that stood out for you uh, geopolitical wise uh, financial mar from a financial market perspective for example no i mean china's having problems which has will lead to more political situations you know i guess china has been the not a good market in 2023 because it had the virus and it, it had various and sundry things, had the housing collapse. I guess the housing collapse in China is certainly a, a notable event. Uh, the Chinese have had a huge bubble, property bubble for a long time. Beijing tried to stop it before. Whoever stopped it now, it stopped. And that's significant. Well, President Xi was also elected for a third time, which is unprecedented uh, in China as well. I think it was in March. So that was a big uh, e event there as well. Um, how, how, how much are you taking the Fed and uh, the Fed policies into consideration as well? Because we, we sort of peaked at five and a quarter percent. And uh, Powell said he was uh, or almost clearly said that they were done raising. Of course, Fed speech is never clear, but uh, it sounded like it. Well, the reason they're never clear is because they don't know what they're doing. 
you know, they don't, they don't have a clue what's going on. Uh, and if they get it right, it's an accident. They haven't been, we've had a couple of good fair, Fed chairmen in the past hundred years, but for the most part, you know, they're bureaucrats and academics. They don't know what they're doing. Absolutely. No, it's it's a lot of guesswork, of course, as well, because they're relying on data. Some of that is uh, quite uh, dated or, or late. It's not a le They're not leading indicators. They're lagging indicators like the job market in the U.S., uh, as, as well. Um, GDP growth was quite a bit of a surprise in the US, 5.2%. Uh, How resilient is the economy right now, Jim? Like, w when you're looking at it, like, do you feel confident in the US economy or the global economy for that matter? Right. The US printed staggering amounts of money. The central bank in Washington, I don't think any central bank has ever printed as much as they did. So, of course, things feel good right now. Well, the Japanese also have printed staggering amounts of money, probably more than they ever have before. So with, between Japan and America printing a lot of money, you know, those are two gigantic economies with a lot of money being printed. A lot of people having a good time. Absolutely. Lots of cheap money out there. Although, if you look at the uh, the savings accounts, it seems like some of that money is being drained out of the system right now. Q QT is that the buzzword here, quantitative tightening. Uh, do you see that uh, pheno phenomenon <laughs> continue in 2024, or are we going back to QE? Well, as I said, nearly always the year before an election in the U.S. is a good year in the stock market. It was again this year. I would suspect that next year will start to show problems. I already see some of the warning signs. You know, so you see some stocks go up every day. The, the list is getting narrower and narrower. You have new people coming into the market who've never been in the market before. They think it's easy. They tell all their friends, they've discovered this new thing called the stock market and it's easy to make money. You know, all, we've seen this movie before. This is not my first rodeo. <laughs> no, absolutely not. But uh, how how did that movie end last time? Was there a happy end or was there a lot of tears? Well, I would suspect that next time, next year, things are not going to look as happy as they look here in December of, yeah. 19, of 2023. Is it fair to assume, Jim, you're in the camp hard landing then? Well, I just I don't I don't know about a hard landing or soft landing. We it's been the longest period in American history without an economic problem. So I mean, maybe we're never going to have economic problems again. The politicians in Washington say they've solved all our problems. Well, if you believe them, everything is great. I happen to have read a little bit of history, and I know that's never been the case. So I'm worried. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I'm not short. I'm not selling short or anything yet. I have cut back enormously, but I'm not shorting, not yet. Yeah, we'll we'll get to that actually, because uh, shorting, because there's always a bull market somewhere if you want to believe, uh, you know, market guru Jim Cramer, and uh, there's always money to be made somewhere, whether it's long, short, or even just long in certain areas, right? But uh, I'm just looking at the S&P 500, and it looks like the market is rallying. There's there's a there's a blow off rally, like it, it's absolutely exploding the market. How confident are you that that continues, or is that the last hurrah before a steeper decline? Well, that's very good insight on your part. Good observation. That's why I'm not shorting yet, because often at the end there's a blow off and things are really crazy. You know, in the, in 1999, I guess it was the market doubled in six months or something in that blow off. So we've had blow offs before. They can be extremely profitable or unprofitable if you're on the wrong side. So no, I would. I am waiting in case there is a blow off, and I hope I'm smart enough to short it if it happens. When you said you reduced exposure in the market, like um, where did you reduce that exposure, Jim? Just curious. Everything, stocks, bonds. I mean, I wouldn't own bonds anywhere in 2023. Bond market certainly a bubble. Uh, you know, I, the cheapest asset that I can see in 2023 is commodities. Uh, you know, silver is down 60% from its all time high, et cetera. But most assets, bonds are a bubble, property in many countries is a bubble, stocks are forming, getting ready for a bubble. No, I'm, I don't see any cheap asset classes except commodities. 
Are you are you focusing on anything particular within the commodity space, or just uh, just broadly? Just just broadly. I'm too simple. <laughs> I'm too um, simple minded. Talking about it's commodities. work. Yeah. It's work. Otherwise. <laughs> Good, good point. Good point. When you dive deeper, um, talking about commodities, like we're we're seeing a bit of disruption in the Red Sea right now. It's um, coming from the geopolitical side. Just just this morning, Reuters put out an article, just mentioning all the shipping companies that are diverting their cargo vessels, being a lot of oil tankers, but also just cargo in general. Uh, is that something that you have that you're keeping a close eye on? Because that could be a bit of fuel to the commodity price fire. Oh, no, of course. I mean, if what you just described could be a gigantic war. I hope it's not. Uh, so, of course, I'm watching it because the Red Sea is a major choke point for the world for many, many things, including oil. So, no, I, I hope everybody's watching it, including me. It seems like it's getting worse or bad enough because even Germany is thinking about sending a ship out there. We are actually sending a ship out there. So if we get involved, it means it's going to be really bad. Right. Um, just curious, like on the whole geopolitical front there, since we since we're touching that topic right now, like how, how do you see this all playing out? Do you have do you have an opinion on that? Well, uh, of course, I have an opinion. But the, the main worry that I as I look out the window and look at the world, I see that more and more people are getting angry with each other. And that often leads to war, trade war, if nothing else. Trade wars are bad enough. Nobody wins trade wars. But they sometimes lead to shooting wars, and certainly nobody wins shooting wars, but they certainly do enormous damage when they occur. Absolutely. And it's, it seems like it, we're headed that way again as well. Like it's all interlinked anyway. So getting Iran well, involved now, which means China might get involved and Russia from one side. So I hope you watch all of this closely because I see many of the same signs you do, and it's not encouraging. No, it's very, very worrisome. Like, I, I actually don't like even talking about it, but we have to discuss it because it does affect markets. Unfortunately, what we're, uh, you know, investing in and uh, it has to do with uh, it's cap from a capitalistic point of view. We have to take a look at that uh, as well. Um, let, let's look at twenty twenty four. You you mentioned a few things already. Some things you're looking forward to. Let's stay on the commodity side for for a minute. Do you have a favorite commodity for twenty twenty four? Anything uh, you're, you're putting extra weight on uh, in terms of investing? Well, if I, agriculture is very depressed, you know, and there are many fundamental problems and have been fundamental problems in agriculture, which usually leads to change. So if I were looking at any specific area, I would get out a list of the agricultural commodities and start looking for opportunities. That's where I see the best opportunity. I mean, gold's at an all time high. I'm not the only one who knows that. <laughs> Oil's been very strong, et cetera, et cetera. Sugar is not very strong. You mentioned gold. That was the next uh, item on my list here is to discuss the all-time high because it doesn't seem like it triggered a lot of follow-up buying. It's just lingering around that level. We're about $50 lower uh, right now from from that all-time high level. Uh, is, th is that a reason of concern to you or is it just uh, taking a breather before it takes up the next or before it takes the next leg up? Well, I own gold, I own silver, I own precious metals I have for many years. They're in the closet. Everybody should have some silver and gold under the bed because if there's a problem, like all of us peasants know when there's a serious catastrophe, you better have some gold and silver in the closet. So I do. But am I running out and buying gold or silver now? No, I'm mainly watching because I certainly own enough of both of those. But everybody should have some gold and silver. Let's say if a crisis comes, you want to have gold and silver. When it comes to the precious metals, so you, it, sound, it sounds like you're only investing in the bullion and the physical right now. You don't own any. You don't own any paper gold or paper silver, for that matter. I do not own any shares. If, well, I do own one gold share, if that's what you mean. No, I mainly own the real stuff. Okay. So no silver ETFs or exchange traded uh, gold or anything like that. So just stay not far, far away from that. I, I have owned them in the past, but I do not own either at the moment. We touched on a geopolitical side as well. We touched on commodities here. Let's, what are some other trends you're looking for for next year? U.S. elections, of course. Um, is, is there anything else uh, like a key topic, uh, top of your mind right now, John? Well, yeah, the main thing is I'm looking for the blow off. If the blow off is going to happen, 
<laughs> historically, that's the way these markets end. We have a blow off at the end. And if that happens, it's going to lead to opportunities for short sellers or, or opportunities for some people. So I worry because, I, as I said before, it's the longest period in American history without a serious problem. So when the next problem comes, it's got to be very bad. Remember, 2008 was a problem because of too much debt. I look out the window. My gosh, the debt since 2009 has skyrocketed everywhere. Even China has a lot of debt now. China didn't have any debt 25 years ago, and so they could save the world in 2008. <laughs> but now even China has a lot of debt. Yeah, c countries with a debt to GDP ratio over 130%, I think historically have always collapsed. All right. Is that something well, you foresee as well? Let's uh, let's be a bit uh, doom and gloom here, Jim. Let's uh, let's take a look at that. Well, you just said it. It's always happened. It's you know when countries get deep, deep, deep in debt, they always have problems. This is not some kind of prediction. This is just simple history. Look up some simple facts. So we we didn't invent any new tools in the last two thousand years that would would sort of prevent that. Do you think history is seriously repeating itself? I'm just uh, you know following well, up on that a little bit. In Washington, Janet Yellen says, don't worry, we got it under control, we know what we're doing, we have figured out a way to solve all these problems. Now, Janet Yellen has degrees from two famous Ivy League universities, so if you believe her, wonderful. I happen not to believe her. I know we're going to have serious problems, partly exacerbated by Washington, but if you believe her, bye, bye, bye. Absolutely. I'm, I'm just looking at uh, some, some of the consequences of, you know, maybe looser monetary policy again next year as well, or even with the rate restrictions. Inflation doesn't seem to be, you know, uh, what do you call it, restrained. Like, we might be a <laughs> resurgence of, uh, of, uh, of inflation, uh, contrary to what, like, a Nobel laureate uh, Paul, Paul Krugman is saying that we beat inflation. Um, what is your opinion on, the, on, the, on that topic as well? Like, do, do you see inflation, uh, you know, down to 2% again? No, I know that we're, the inflation is not finished. Markets, you know, go up, they correct, they go up, they correct. That's what's happened with inflation. Things feel better right now, and they are better right now. But no, Kai, inflation is not finished, and we're going to have more of it, and it's going to be serious. I hope you're worried. Oh, definitely. <laughs> if you're not worried, you don't know what's going on. Absolutely. No, that's what the, one of the reasons we're running this channel here. We're trying to educate a little bit. We're trying to understand the macro, to understand the micro a little better. What is influencing price movements, not just on the inflation or within your shopping cart, but uh, also within your portfolio, of course, uh, as, well, as well. Money printing has always led to many things lead to inflation, but especially money printing. And there's been staggering amounts of money printing in the last several months, years, in fact. So it's got to be very bad next time. Uh, Follow-up question to what you you mentioned earlier is like shorting the market. Um, what are some areas you would short? Just general, the S&P 500, is that an area uh, or, or an asset you would short? Or is there anything else? Well, normally, you, when, you, when the market comes to an end, the last high flyers are the best shorts. You know the Magnificent Seven, whatever they're called. You know the stocks that have done extremely well and that are very expensive. That, I hope, is where I'm smart enough to short next time around. Gotcha. Fantastic. Um, I, mean, I, I quoted Jim Cramer earlier, a bit of a controversial figure, of course, in investing cycles. But uh, there's always a bull market somewhere, right? Even, even in a crash scenario, there's always a market going up. Is that just commodities for you next year? Well, uh, who knows? I, 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 Uzbekistan, I, I started investing in Uzbekistan, but that's not a big enough market to save, save all of us. There are not many markets. China's down. China's probably an opportunity. Japan has been going up finally. Japan will probably make new all-time highs soon for the first time in you know decades. But other than places like Japan, China, Uzbekistan, I, and agriculture, I don't see many things that are great opportunities that are very cheap. I, I need to follow up on that. You mentioned Japan, and Japan has a debt to GDP ratio twice as high as the US, for example. Like, what makes you confident about Japan? 
I didn't say I was confident. Oh, I said the market's going to make new highs. <laughs> That's a different story. Okay. You know, the Bank of Japan has been buying shares. Uh, they've been passing laws to encourage people to invest. All of these things have happened before. And when they happen, especially if you have a depressed market, you know, the Japanese market made its high 35 years ago. That's not a typo. 35 years ago. And now the Jap Japanese bank, the central bank, is buying. The new tax laws are good for people who buy shares. You know, there are reasons to think that Japan may go up. Now, Japan has horrible problems, Guy. You know, Japan's had a declining population for 15 years now. The debt is skyrocketing, as you point out. No, Japan, unless something happens, there's not going to be a Japan in 50 years. Wow. Yeah, no, absolutely. Interest, 260% debt to GDP ratio is, is staggering. The yen is absolutely tumbling against the US dollar as well. But uh, the Nikkei is running, as you, as you said. So that uh, there, there is the opportunity. Uh, Jim, same question actually about China as well. What, uh, uh, let's, let's scratch confident. What makes it an interesting opportunity to invest? Well, China's had the virus and they had a real estate bubble pop, a huge bubble pop. So China's had some problems, uh, which is why the markets are down, which is why the economy has been slow. But most problems come to an end. You can, I can think I can see the end of the property bubble coming to an end. I think I can see some of the problems and the virus coming to an end. And if that's the case, China is not a bad place to invest because it's a huge economy and lots of people working very hard. A guest on the program mentioned I, to take a closer look at iron ore prices, which have rallied 40% since May. And uh, that often has to do with China. Is that an indicator you might consider as well and to look at for, for Chinese uh, maybe resurgence or rebound? Well, of course. I mean, I'm glad you pointed it out. I know it's been going through the roof. And that's partly because the Chinese economy may have hit bottom. And if so, I know it's going to be in demand, it is in demand. Sure, looks like it. Um, on, on the property side, like it, uh, it doesn't seem like the Evergrande bubble and the... Uh... I always want to say Olive Garden, but it's not Olive Garden. It's the other company, um, the property developer in uh, in, in China, uh, has has yet to completely sort of uh, explode, implode, because uh, a lot of international lenders uh, are involved in those property companies and property developers as well. Do you see international ramifications coming out of that as well? Could that be a potential trigger for a global recession or even depression? Well, we usually have something that when we have a big recession or depression, something triggers it. But it's usually a lot of nothing. There's no one thing. I mean, we the press talks about one thing, but these things accumulate over over time. More and more small things turn into big things, and the next thing you know, it's on the evening news, and everybody says, "Oh my God, Lehman Brothers is bankrupt." You know, but things were already going bad long before Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. It's always the, the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's like something that people can hang their head on, right? And it's like, okay, this was it. Instead of ignoring all the other signs, like uh, we've seen in March, for example, all the banks collapsing in the U.S., for example. But you're exactly right. These things build up. If you look back at 2007, 2008, you know, Iceland went bankrupt. If anybody knew, they didn't care. But it was the first, uh, one of the first steps along the way until eventually Lehman Brothers went bankrupt and we all said, oh my gosh, look what just happened. But Bear Stearns had gone bankrupt a few months before, et cetera. These things don't happen with one day, with one, one event. Absolutely. Jim, we're drawing a very gloomy picture here. Um, I'm trying to find, a, to find a way to end the conversation a bit on a positive note. Um, is, is commodities really, or are, are commodities really the only like sort of light at the end of the tunnel here? Well, I mean, as I look out the window here, I don't see anything. I don't see stocks anywhere except a couple of companies, countries I mentioned. I don't see bonds. I see bonds. I know bonds are a bubble. I don't see property. I guess there's some great property opportunities somewhere, but not they're not wild widespread across the board. I, Kai, I wish I could see something. I'd like to look out the window and find something great, but unfortunately, out my window, I don't see these things right now. I'm looking, 
I certainly would like to find, but I cannot put all my money in Uzbekistan or agriculture. Maybe maybe one last uh, positive note, like the, the blow off top. How do you how long do you think it is going to to last? Do you have do you have an inkling of like sort of a well? My, I I remember two thousand eight, and we had a big problem. Kai, since two thousand eight, the debt everywhere has skyrocketed. Japan, I'm everywhere, everywhere. So the next problem has to be the worst in my lifetime, because the debt is just unbelievable. What, and it's happening in all over the world. And I don't see how the next problem cannot be the worst in my lifetime. I mean, I'm not sitting here trying to scare you. I'm just looking at facts. And I see all this debt everywhere. It's got to lead to big problems. When, when it all comes to an end, somebody's going to suffer. I hope I'm not one of them. I hope you're not. I hope your viewers are not. That's that's why we're doing this, sort of prepare them and to, to try to understand what is going on in the world. But what what is the best inflation hedge for you right now, Jim? Sort of as a last question. Well, I would suspect agriculture. Uh, I mean, I own silver and gold and things, but I would suspect agriculture. I said silver's down, uh, sugar's down sixty percent from its all time high. That's not a bubble, <laughs> you know. Most agricultural products have been suffering for a long time. The average age of farmers in America is 58. The average age of farmers in Japan is 69. I mean, nobody wants to be a farmer. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that there may be opportunities in agriculture going forward. Fantastic. Jim, wonderful conversation. Like we ran through so many topics. Uh, really, really insightful. I truly appreciate your time. I know you don't have a newsletter or anything to sell, but where can we find more of you or uh, get more of your information? I don't have anything to sell. I'm just a simple person sitting here trying to survive. Uh, I'm on the I'm, uh, people interview me at times like you. Uh, that's all I know. Jim, no, I truly appreciate your time, especially, as I said before, the Christmas holidays. I'm, I'm sure, uh, you know, it's time to wind down a little bit. I'm sure looking forward to it as well. Looking forward to the holiday break here. Again, thank you so much for your time. All the best for 2024. And uh, looking forward to catching up with you again very, very soon. So, Thank you, Kai. Uh, Let's hope there is a 2024. Fingers crossed. Don't worry. We will we, have it. We will I was going to say, it. we got 12 days. So, <laughs> Don't worry. We'll have, we'll have a 2024. Fantastic. The world will keep turning. Absolutely. And uh, everybody else, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. We truly appreciate your time and really appreciate you logging in. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to the channel so we can bring guests like Jim Rogers back on the channel more frequently. It really helps us out. And if you have an opinion, what is going to happen? We touched on so many topics. How do you see things developing? Do you own physical gold and silver? What is your best inflation hedge? What do you, th what do you see is happening in the Red Sea right now? Lots and lots to discuss. Put that in the comments below. We read all of them. Trust me. Really happy to hear from you. And uh, we'll be back with lots, lots more. Thank you so much. Happy holidays. And uh, all the best for 2024.